Janma Yasya Yato Nivyad Itaratas Chateswa Vigyaswara Janma Yasya Yatam Bayaratas Tene Brahma Hirdaya Adikavaye Muyantiyat Surayaha Tene Brahma Hirdaya Adikavaye Tejo Vari Medam Yata Vini Mayo Yatra Trisargomasha Tejo Vari Medam Yata Vini Mayo Damna Svena Sada Nirasta Kuhakam Satyam Parandi Mahi Damna Svena Sada Nirasta Kuhakam O my Lord, Sri Krishna, Son of Vasudeva, O all-pervading Personality of Godhead, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because He is the Absolute Truth and the primal cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji, the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water, only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Projita Kaitravotra Paramoni Matsunam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Sivadam Tapa Trayon Mudanam Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kimva Parir Ishwaraha Sadyo Hridi Avurudyate Tra Kriti bihi sususubhistaksunat. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. By the culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpatarur galitam falam sukamukad amrita dravya samnyutam pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam muhur ahoraska bhuvibhava kaha. O expert and thoughtful man, relish Srimad Bhagavatam, the mature fruit of the desire to read Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful, although its nectar and juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Swakata Krishna. 
Punya Shravana Kirtana Hedyantak Stohi Abhadrani Vidunati Srihitsatam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna who is dwelling within everyone's heart, acts as a best-wishing friend and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nastapresu Bhadresu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya <clears throat> Bhagavati Ustama Sloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naistiki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about the uh, Krishna about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord by development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance, and thus material lusts and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogataha bhagavat tattva vigyanam mukta sangha sajayate when these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness, becomes enlivened by devotional service, and understands the science of God perfectly. Thus, Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. Understanding of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I'm sorry, understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 15, verse number 43. Chitravasa Niraharo. Padavan Mukta Murdaja Darshayan Atmano Rupam Jadon Mata Pisachavat Anavek Samano Niragad Asirvan Padiro Yata Translation by Srila Prabhupada. After that, Maharaj Yudhisthira dressed himself in torn clothing, gave up eating all solid foods, voluntarily became dumb, and let his hair hang loose. All this combined to make him look like an urchin or madman with no occupation. He did not depend on his brothers for anything, and just like a deaf man, he heard nothing. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. 
thus being freed from all external affairs. He had nothing to do with imperial life or family prestige. And for all practical purposes, he posed himself exactly like an inert, mad urchin and did not speak of material affairs. He had no dependence on his brothers, who had all along been helping him. This stage of complete independence from everything is also called the purified stage of fearlessness. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. <clears throat> wow, this is a very severe type of renunciation that all of us will eventually face if we want to go back to Godhead. If we want to stay in the material world, then we'll stay attached to home and hearth, to all kinds of comforts, uh, massage chairs, uh, saunas, comfortable cars, comfortable bed, all those things. And we'll think, we can't get along without these things. But actually, it's not true. One actually doesn't need any of those things. One can be perfectly happy, uh, especially in the end of life, by cutting off all such unnecessary things and depending completely on the mercy of the Lord. So this is what Maharaj Yudhisthira is going to do. He doesn't depend now on anybody else's mercy except Krishna's. And he puts himself completely at the disposal of the Lord and he wants to stop all mundane talks and mundane subjects and simply meditate on the transcendental activities of the Lord and by chanting his name and by engaging in his service and by meditating on him all day long. So, <clears throat> the, when a person is successful, it's usually counted in terms of wealth, prestige, influential friends, and uh, nice family, nice children, nice house, car. All these things are symbolism of success. Nice teeth, nice hair, uh, no wrinkles, and so forth. So, and they're all external things. One can be a horrible person and have all those things. And usually people that have all those things are uh, somewhat horrible. But uh, when one gives up all those external symbols of success and turns completely inside to, to the real success, even the Muslims say this. The Muslims say there are two jihads. One is the external jihad, and the other is the internal jihad. Jihad meaning war, you know, justifiable war. And they say that the internal jihad is more difficult than the outside, outside jihad, because you have to control lust, anger, greed, all those things. Well, it's the same for us, that uh, we have to control the mind, and the senses, and the body, and... Prabhupada explains that there, there are a whole class of yogis who purposely, severely restrict their, their, their sense pleasures and they, they purposely seek out suffering and tolerate it, such as going naked in winter in the Himalayas and staying in the freezing water of the Ganges for hours, sometimes days and not moving. And, and, and wintertime in the Himalayas is extremely cold. It can go down minus 40 degrees. But yet they're willing to uh, submit themselves or, or to such suffering so that they lose all sense of bodily comfort and bodily happiness. Well, we don't have to do that. And why not? We're supposed to be yogis. By the way, did Arjuna ever do anything like that? No. He never did any asanas. He never did any pranayamas. He never did any of that. But yet he's the greatest yogi. Why? 
because he completely dedicated himself to serving Krishna without any selfish motive. And he was always focused on pleasing the Lord. Of course, he didn't come to that position overnight, but through so many tribulations, every time the Pandavas would depend on the Lord to help them because their situation was hopeless, and uh, every time the Lord helped them. So they developed this faith that they should always listen to the Lord and surrender to him and depend on him. So when you depend on mundane people to help you, you will be let down. Uh, there's a saying that uh, if, if, you're, uh, if you uh, slipped on a cliff and are holding on to, let's say, uh, some plants, uh, like a, a tree that's growing out of rock to save you from falling down, and someone comes and throws you a rope and says, take this rope, I'll save you. Well, you don't know for sure if that's a good person or a bad person. It might be a good person who will save you. It might be a bad person who will trick you and, and let you fall. So <laughs> that is uh, what happens. Like, for example, there was an article in the newspaper that said, uh, only some hospitals are successful in treating prostate cancer. Well, that puts a big doubt in people's minds. So, wait a minute, is the hospital I'm going to one of those hospitals or not, right? So, you know, prostate cancer is a very serious thing, and, and if, if they make a mistake, you're dead. So uh, th there are many hospitals, but which one is the right hospital? So in life, it's like that. We, we can't really depend on anyone uh, except Krishna and Krishna's pure devotees. Uh, why? Because most people have uh, material desires. It's called the, their, their decision-making is hovering on the mental platform. The mental platform is accepting and rejecting based on sense gratification, accepting and rejecting things based on sense gratification. So, therefore, if a person's on the mental platform, uh, sometimes they won't do the right thing because of self-interest. And, and if you depend on people like that, you will be let down. So, therefore, we have to be able to recognize people. How do you recognize people? Well, you read the 16th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, I'm sorry, you read the 14th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. The 14th chapter is the three modes of material nature. If you read this chapter carefully, then you can analyze people very easily by seeing which mode of nature they are predominantly controlled by. And if it turns out to be passion and ignorance, it's a big no-no. You don't want to depend on people like that. If it's goodness, uh, you can depend on them uh, for a certain degree, much more than the people in passion and ignorance. And if it's transcendental goodness, you can completely depend on them because they will not have any selfish interest as a priority in their life. Their only interest is to please Guru and Krishna. So in the 14th chapter, it says... <clears throat> it says, from the mode of goodness, real knowledge develops. From the mode of passion, greed develops. And from the mode of ignorance, develop foolishness, madness, and illusion. So, if you choose to be friends with someone in the mode of passion, by associating them, you'll become greedy and lusty. If you associate with people in the mode of ignorance, you'll do foolish things, crazy things, in a state of illusion. Right? Just like there was a young boy in Australia, and he was with his young friends. They were, maybe, they were teenagers. And the friends dared him to eat a slug. And he took the dare and ate a slug. And then he got what's called... Uh, uh, slug rat 
disease. So he became a vegetable almost overnight. Couldn't think, couldn't eat properly, couldn't go to the bathroom, and couldn't focus his mind by eating a slug. And well, why did he do it? I mean, normally he wouldn't do it, but because his friends dared him to eat a slug, he grabbed the slug and threw it in his mouth and swallowed it. So, <laughs> you see how dangerous it is uh, associating with people in the mode of ignorance. You, can, you, you become foolish and crazy and you do things in a state of illusion. Then if you associate with people who are successful in life, they have nice houses and they have a, a wine cellar in the house uh, it's, it's, and, and they have these expensive wines, you know, Chardonnay, 1932, whatever. And uh, they, they're proud of all these material external things that, that make them look special. So what happens when you associate people like that? You become lusty and greedy. And if you associate with pe people in the mode of goodness, you begin to develop uh, knowledge. Like, for example, I knew this one man. He was the Johnny Appleseed of France. Now, who is Johnny Appleseed? He was a famous person in America who... Uh, would always plant apple trees wherever he went. He was like a, a wandering sadhu, American sadhu. Not that he was like a pure devotee, but uh, his thing was apple trees. So they had a man like that in France also. He was always traveling around. He would hitchhike, and he would plant trees for free and then maintain them so that... So then he had, like, in the summertime, he was in the north of France, where in winter it's very cold. And then in the wintertime, he'd be in the south of France, where uh, the weather's very mild, even in the winter. And he would go around planting trees and, and then also grafting them, putting, like, three or four different fruits on one tree. And... Uh, so I, my, I had a little farm also at that time in, in, in near New Mayapur. And he would come and stay with me like two weeks. He planted 300 fruit trees. And I didn't have to buy them. He would uh, have bare, fruit, uh, bare root uh, trees that he would grow in, in one place. And then he would uproot them and bring them and plant them in another place. And, and, and then he would stay for a couple weeks take care of all the trees, and, uh, and he would only eat fruit from those trees. And he was a very, very nice man, you know, and he was a bit of a poet and a folk hero. And, uh, but, I mean, he was not, you know, and he, he respected Krishna consciousness because we were into natural living, but he was not actually a devotee, but he was, uh, he was trying to live in the mode of goodness. And whenever you would, he would come, he would teach you things all the time about plants. And, and, uh, and everybody liked him because he was not a selfish guy. He, was, he, he, didn't, he didn't accept any money. And, and so there are people like this in the world, you say. And when you associate with people like that, they're, they're more or less, they're not completely, but more or less in the mode of goodness. And you learn from them. And, and it's uplifting. So... You can recognize people uh, and understand who they are, what they are, if you read the 14th chapter carefully. And in, in, a, in about one or two minutes, you, you can understand which mode is predominant in their life. Like, all you have to do is look at a person's plate when they're ready to eat. That'll tell you a lot about them, right? So if they have a piece of meat <laughs> and, and a little glass of wine and so forth, you know they're a really low-class person, right? So uh, this ability to recognize people by uh, understanding the modes of na nature is important. So you see, what is uh, Maharaj Yudhisthira doing? He's taking away and he's eliminating everything that's a symbol of a king and a materially successful person and he's appearing to be either like a crazy 
person or a great saint. It's hard to tell the difference between a crazy person and a great saint until they speak, because they might look the same, you know, disheveled hair and uh, uh, old or very uh, simple clothes and so forth. But uh, when they speak, then you could tell if someone is crazy or if they're actually a, a genuine sadhu. So being, a, being freed from all external affairs, he had nothing to do with imperial life or family prestige. And for all practical purposes, he posed himself exactly like an inert, mad urchin. That means like a child who's crazy and lazy. So, so we have a lot of craziness and lazies in America today, a lot of them. Um, and uh, he did not speak of material affairs. He had no dependence on his brothers or anyone else. And uh, this was uh, a stage of what's called complete independence from everything. And it's also called the purified stage of fearlessness, abayam. So that he, he took the external appearance of it and internally also he acted like that. Preparing himself for what? Preparing himself for going back to Godhead. Srila Prabhupada Kije. Are there any questions? We have to follow the general idea of it. Right? You have to stop talking about the business, about finances, about maintaining the family and being attached to this or that. Right? Most people can't do this. It's almost impossible. So <laughs> this, this lady just died, uh, uh, Earth ba uh, something, Bader Ginsburg, right? She's a Supreme Court judge. So her last desire was that Trump should not appoint uh, 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 someone to take her position until after the election. That's her last thought. That's her last desire. So I see how crazy people are, right? Instead of thinking about, you know, wh what's going to happen to her and where she's going to go, she's worrying about politics right up to the last minute of her life. So that's, that's a failed life. No matter how much she's touted to be a brilliant jurist and a brilliant uh, lawyer and whatever, and you know, everyone's talking about how smart she is. But actually, she's dumb, right? Because she's not thinking about what's most important. That's what's going to happen to her. She's worrying about, you know, I don't want Trump to appoint someone in my position position hopefully he'll lose the election and, and we'll get another liberal like me on the court see that's what this, she's thinking about so uh it's a very dangerous life because something horrible will happen uh, after they die because their mind is not focused at all on krishna <clears throat> any other questions So we can focus our mind on Krishna easily and happily by chanting and dancing and feasting, you see. It's not a sad thing when a person dies in Krishna consciousness. So when Haridas Thakur left his body in the arms of Lord Chaitanya, looking at the Lord, then the Lord picked him up and started dancing with his body in, in uh, Jagannath Puri, right? And they did like a, a Harinam Sankirtan with, with the Lord, with, uh, with the body of Haridas Thakur. And then they put him into Samadhi uh, on the beach. You can go and see his Samadhi there. It's right, right on the beach or near the beach. You know? So it was, it, was a, it was not a sad affair. It was a joyful affair. Right? Whereas, you know, what's going on today, the whole thing is 
sad, you know, and foolish, very foolish. Everyone's thinking, and right up to the last moment, about material affairs. <clears throat> so Krishna consciousness is happiness, right from the beginning to the end. You don't have to be these, like these yogis, you know, S uh, standing in the Ganges, freezing Ganges water in the middle in the middle of winter in the Himalayas, you know, purposely subjecting their body to suffering and and tolerating it. I mean, it's 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 a great effect, a great achievement if you're able to do that, but it's unnecessary. Lord Chaitanya's process, all ecstasy, every aspect of his happiness. Sila Prabhupada ki Yeah. As severe it appears, it's kind of a notion. So it's not something really you can just decide and do it. I think I used to be something in, in you can you, know, you have you have to have knowledge and you have to be generally decided, natural. And you can just do the police. Practice it. Well, out of plus, uh, over one billion people, there may be a few only that are doing it in the Himalayas. And when I say a few, you could probably count them on your hands. That's how few people are actually doing that. That's a very rare thing that someone can do that. Exceptionally. Yeah. Very, very rare. So you can see, I mean, that's not practical for society but lord chaitanya's process everyone can do it kids can do it old people can do it s smart people can do it dumb people can do it rich people can do it poor people can do it anybody can chant and dance and feast it's full of happiness you don't have to sit around being a bookworm the rest of your life studying this studying that you don't have to be a severe yogi you don't have to do pujas all the time. You just chant and dance and feast. What could be better than that? And that's what's going on in the spiritual world. What, what, what does it say? Every day is a festival, right? Didn't we read that? That, uh, yeah. Where, where do we read that? Um, Anyway, every day is a festival. So how could that be bad? That's what Krishna consciousness is. And Prabhupada said that uh, we can have a festival every day in, in Krishna consciousness because every day something auspicious has happened in history. So many saints have left their bodies or have appeared. And so many festivals in Krishna consciousness that every day you could have one. <clears throat> and this is what happens when if you live like in a place uh, like uh, let's say Shirangam uh, Tirupati uh, and uh, in uh, Rajasthan uh, and Jagannath Puri every day is a festival you know they have uh, processions, they have special uh, ceremonies, and uh, there's, no, there's no lack of transcendental life. So that's what we're supposed to do, that's what the temple should be like that. Of course, when we didn't have, didn't, didn't have this uh, Chinese flu, it was like that. <laughs> it was just about every day, and there's big, big cooking, and and serving people and the kirtan and the classes and uh, you know all, all these ceremonies and things like that it's just wonderful so that's Prabhupada's mercy Hare Krishna all glories to Srila Prabhupada